Hello and welcome to Original Sound Chat, where video game music is a work of art. On each episode, it's our goal to help you learn about two soundtracks from the world of games, as well as the people, stories, and critical tracks behind them. My name is Joe DeVader. And I'm Peter Spasia. We're brought to you by Anonymous Dinosaur and Rhymes with Asia. It's time to appreciate great OSTs and the games they come from without getting too bogged down in music theory. Up first this week for our two games is 2002's Soul Calibur 2. The tale of souls and swords eternally retold, that famously featured guest characters from across video games and comic books. Following that is the fast-paced, unique take on the fighting game formula that fuses Street Fighter with Pong alongside a healthy dose of Jet Set Radio's aesthetic, 2018's Lethal League Blaze. Yes, these are both fighting games, in a sense... I think Soul Calibur 2, you're definitely talking about a more traditional fighter. But I'm trying to think back in my knowledge of gaming history to think, was this one of the first big fighting games to feature, like, highlighted cameo guest fighters? I mean, we're not talking like a Marvel versus Capcom sort of wide crossover. Yeah, it's not a game where the, the point is that it is a crossover. I think you might be right. Yeah, it's really out there in that regard. So it's kind of groundbreaking, a pretty big gimmick there. Uh, but for Lethal League Blaze, there's nothing else like it. And yet, it's a fighting game for all intents and purposes with the mind games. I fail to be able to call it anything else because I don't know what else to call it if it's not a fighting game. And yet, even at the same time, it's that's... It's kind of a stretch, but I don't know. Stylish, hyped Pong. I, I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> Joe, how are you doing? What are you playing? I'm doing pretty all right. Uh, I 100% completed Banjo-Kazooie since last we talked. Oh. I'm talking all jiggies, all notes, all honeycombs. Well done. Uh, it was uh, the first time I've ever done that. Certainly helps with some of the quality of life changes that the Xbox 360 version added, such as the fact that you don't need to get all 100 notes in one life. That's just, that, that change alone is basically what makes it possible. And uh, the final boss sucks. Just going to come out and say it. Final boss of Banjo-Kazooie is a bad final boss. But uh, otherwise, my roommate and I finished playing Man of Badon. Continues to sure exist uh little hope comes out next month on the 30th i don't know if we're gonna play it right away probably not uh i i don't know if i'm down to hand them my cash after man of badon <laughs> so i might just wait till that shows up on game pass if it does who knows uh and other than that i started playing hades for a reason that we will get to later <laughs> shortly uh you also beat control congrats i did i went back and finished control <laughs> because i beat control as well and yeah would not have been possible without newly installed difficulty settings so thank you remedy <laughs> i appreciate it remedy i had an hour left of your game <laughs> <laughs> yeah no so that was that was definitely good it, really interesting ending a little quirky like the fake out there, uh, but mm -hmm. really hard to explain to someone, like, if someone hasn't been watching the game, really hard to explain what the game's about <laughs> and the story. Just going to put that out there. Especially if you don't have the context of, like, well, it's SCP, because then when they ask, what is SCP, you're like, ah... <laughs> Uh, yeah, I was like, uh, um, <laughs> the supernatural blending of dimensions into our world and the subconscious. Uh, I, I, it's like, it's, that's really difficult. So, and then I'm uh, in a little more grounded in a weird sense. When we're talking about superheroes, I'm in the middle of uh, the Marvel's Avengers campaign. Uh, you may remember t talking a few weeks ago, I was saying like, I didn't really like the demo. But then I came across a rental. Thank you, Gamefly, uh, for kind of the only reason I'm playing through it, that I'm not dropping 60 bucks on it. It's fun. I do like the more grounded story focusing on Kamala Khan as the, the protagonist, really, that drives the action. I, I think that makes it more reasonable than the demo missions that they just throw at you randomly. I've heard that the 
single player campaign is very good. I am very tempted to pick it up myself, but uh, our friend Matt kind of convinced me to wait a little bit because it'll probably be the game will probably go down to like thirty dollars. Oh yeah, in the oh, next yeah. couple months, and also they'll have put in some performance uh, patches to help it run a little bit better by then. So mm-hmm. probably going to wait a little while on that. I've had it run fine on Xbox One X, but I uh, can't say the same necessarily for others. But yeah, I think that's a good idea. That you don't need it at sixty unless you're gonna. And that's the thing. Like with these games as a service, like I'm not gonna devote years of my life playing this. So like I just want to experience it and then mm-hmm. bounce. So let's talk about some of the composer follow-up news from the past week. The composers we've talked about on this show, they still work on cool, amazing things, and sometimes their work comes up. In the video game headlines from the past week, let's talk about that big PlayStation 5 game showcase that officially revealed the release date and the price of the system. Uh, We're talking Xbox Series X and Series S on November 10th. PlayStation 5 is on November 12th. Uh, Both top-line models at $500, $499. Smart of PlayStation to cut their digital version by $100, considering... All of the money they'll make on those systems in the back end with digital game margins. Uh, that was, I think was really smart of them to do. Some people are like, a disk drive doesn't cost $100, but... Mm. It kind of sounds like it does not have the same spec drop that the Series S sounds like it has, so that's probably why. Exactly, it's the exact same that way, just no disk drive. So, in that PlayStation 5 event, though, the reveal of Final Fantasy 16 is especially interesting because one Yoshi P is the producer, Naoki Yoshida, who saved Final Fantasy 14. if you remember listening to that episode of Original Sound Chat. Which means there's a non-zero chance that Masayoshi Soken is on the soundtrack. Fingers crossed. I think that would be amazing. And they, they look like... That game could maybe come late 21, early 22. And they said 21, but Final Fantasy game could easily get pushed. Uh, Spider-Man, Miles Morales. You know, John Paisano's very likely on that soundtrack, but uh, we got to hear some of the soundtrack during combat and adding those trap drums. Wow. Amazing. Really taking some cues from Spider-Verse, I think. Yeah, I I think absolutely. And that's 100% the right call. And then the tease at the end of the new God of War title, having Bear McCreary's God of War theme cue in there. I can only imagine he'd be working on the sequel. So excited. They say 21. And they're probably pretty far along in development since they had the engine already there, but I would not be surprised to see that one slip as well. A very exciting event. Probably one of the best game showcases I've ever seen in my years of watching. I mean, they they came out swinging, which is pretty good. Meanwhile, Nintendo, literally the next day, uh, came out and had a partner showcase, another partner showcase. They seem to be doing these, like, every month now. Among the various things that they announced, two games were actually announced to be available on that day, and so they're available on Nintendo Switch now. First being Ori and the Will of the Wisps, which I expected us to wait a whole year before that game showed up on Switch, minimum. And it hasn't even, has it even been like six months? Yeah, I think it just passed six months. And it's I Am 8-Bit Publishing, which is interesting on that one. Mm-hmm. Like, that's very, uh, that's very soon. That's way sooner than I expected to see Will of the Wisp on Switch. And it apparently has been completely, like, optimized for the system. It runs great, from what I hear. And then, uh, Hades has exited early access on PC and has hit Nintendo Switch as well. I actually started playing it because uh, we did not get a review code, but I was instructed to just buy it, and they'll give me the money back. And I'll, <laughs> I'm playing Hades right now, and I've only played about an hour, so I have a long way to go before I can write a review of a roguelike. You can't just write one of those with an hour of gameplay time, but it's so far very, very good. Shouts out to Gareth Coker and Darren Korb on those soundtracks, respectively. And finally, Katamari Damashi Reroll, which is the remastered version of the game originally on Switch and PC. It's now coming to PlayStation 4 and Xbox One on November 20th. So give that one a shot if you have not already. Really bizarre that it took so long. I kind of forgot they weren't on there. 
because it's been over a year since that game came out. <laughs> but hey, now it will be on every major platform, so that's excellent. Let's start talking about these games, though. These weird, gimmicky fighting games. And we'll start with Soul Calibur 2. What is the Soul Calibur series, though? It all started with a game called Soul Edge, which was a 1995 arcade game by Namco that got ported to the original PlayStation in 1996 in Japan and then was renamed to Soul Blade for a 1997 North America and Europe release. Its sequel, Soul Calibur, was a 1998 arcade release, but then was ported to Sega Dreamcast in 1999. But then, transcending history and the world, a tale of souls and swords eternally retold. Soul Calibur II, released in arcades in Japan on July 10th, 2002, and in North America sometime in 2002. Then came the Nintendo GameCube, PlayStation 2, and Xbox release in Japan on March 27th, 2003, North America on August 27th, 2003, and Europe on September 26th, 2003. There was an HD online remaster version made for Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3, and that came out in around November 2013. Uh, that version of the game is compatible on Xbox One, so if you're looking to play this game for some reason going forward, the easiest way to do so may be through that Xbox One and uh, future next generation series of devices with the Series X and S. But yeah, I mean, if you wanted to play the original, I, I think the GameCube, PS2, and Xbox One would be the way to go if you want that true original experience. The game is developed by Project Soul and published by Namco. Soul Calibur 2 is a 3D fighting game with an eight-way run system. That means the game isn't locked to a 2D plane like a 2D fighter, uh, but imagine like an invisible string between these fighters. You can get closer or further away from each other, but you can also strafe around opponents in like a circle, whether it's farther away from the circle or closer to the screen. And you do this for dodging and just repositioning away overall uh, because there are stage walls or pits that you could fall into. And so it's like this string that keeps getting adjusted in, in 3D space between these two fighters. So the story of Soul Calibur 2, it's 1590 AD in a medieval historical fantasy version of the world, and it takes place four years after the end of the events of Soul Calibur. The evil sword Soul Edge has been shattered into pieces by the holy sword Soul Calibur. Important to note, the sword is in two words, Soul Calibur, uh, B-U-R at the end, but the game is traditionally stylized in one word as Soul Calibur. Just need to make that as a note. Uh, but the Soul Edge is always a threat to be reforged from its parts. When Soul Edge's fragments begin causing chaos and evil to grow in the world, different warriors embark on their own personal new journeys, driven either to possess or destroy the evil sword. Meanwhile, Soul Edge's previous owner, the Azure Knight Nightmare, starts his rampage anew, seeking souls to gain the power to restore Soul Edge once again. What will be the fate of this tale of swords and souls? Joe, here's where I'll ask you, what are our experiences with Soul Calibur 2? Uh, mine are basically non-existent. I know of the game's existence because it's the Soul Calibur with a certain guest character in it that is always mentioned. But for the most part, uh, the only Soul Calibur game I've ever played is a little bit of 4 where I played as Yoda and Darth Vader and was like, that's a stupid pick. And <laughs> I haven't really played any Soul Calibur since. Uh, I've been tempted every once in a while to pick up Soul Calibur 5, but I've never really ended up doing it. So yeah, I've never played two. And now they're on six. I mean, a game that really caught fire with not only its character creator being so good and so diverse, but also some, uh, DLC picks overall, because it was Soul Calibur 2 that really 
started the idea of, oh, guest characters coming into games. And obviously Super Smash Brothers Ultimate, the master now. But I think it really did start, if I'm not mistaken, with Soul Cal 2. Soul Calibur 2 was the first traditional fighting game I ever owned. I am terrible at the game. <laughs> but uh, it was one of those ones to get, especially with the GameCube guest character. Uh, the GameCube version, I think, would be the most popular version of the game, if I had to guess. There, there was not complete sales data, let's just say, but they did give sales data for the GameCube version, so I think that's that's fitting. But yeah, it's... It's quite the game. I think it's well outdated now as Soul Calibur continues to go on and improve upon itself, but it's a sign of the early 2000s in games and a sign of where those kind of fighting games were at the time. And my goodness, what high expectations to meet after coming off of the original Soul Calibur, one of the best reviewed games of all time on Sega Dreamcast. I mean, we mentioned uh, last week with Super Mario Galaxy and how was, that was the fifth highest rated game on Metacritic. Well, Soul Calibur is like the second. So <laughs> it's a high bar to clear. And I, I think they did rather well. The characters that come back for Soul Calibur 2, returning characters include Astaroth, Cervantes, Ivy, Kilik, Maxi, Mitsurugi, Nightmare, Songmina, Sofitia, Taki, Voldo, Shanghua, and Yoshimitsu. New characters include Cassandra, Raphael, Talim, Yunsung, and Charade. There was also a new character called Necrid, and Necrid was an original character designed by comic creator Todd McFarlane. Necrid was exclusive to the home console version. He was not in the arcade version. There were also these generic characters called Assassin, Berserker, and Lizardman, and their movesets were based off of original Soul Calibur characters of Huang, Rock, and Lizardman. But it's really the guest characters that really shine here, and it's Link from The Legend of Zelda on the Nintendo GameCube version of Soul Calibur 2. Like, that was a huge selling point for that version of the game specifically. Heihachi from Tekken, featured in the PlayStation 2 version, and Todd McFarlane's Spawn on the Xbox version. Which, there's actually a reference to that. Spawn is in Mortal Kombat 11. He was one of the DLC fighters. And appar apparently there's actually a reference to the fact that he was in Soul Calibur in that game now. That's fantastic, as it should be. The most fascinating thing I learned in my research was that, isn't it weird that Heihachi is also a Namco character with Tekken and Tekken and Soul Calibur at the time were the big 3D fighting games, right? It seems like not as much of a reach. Well, for the PlayStation 2 version, Project Soul was trying to get a licensing deal done with Square to get Cloud Strife as PlayStation 2's guest character until the licensing deal fell through at the last minute, according to localization producer Now Higo. So basically, when we hear horror stories about how Cloud almost didn't come back to Smash Ultimate, that is just a thing that Square has been like for years. Especially at a time when they were really struggling as a company, as you have been mentioning on, in the past on this show. Yeah, that, uh doesn't seem like the right time for them to be kind of squeamish about stuff like this, but hey, it worked out, I guess. Mm -hmm. And they had the backup plan of Heihachi pulling from Tekken. Unsurprisingly, I suppose, Heihachi and Spawn are both in the HD online version of the game, but because it was on Xbox 360 and PS3, and not Wii or Wii U, Link is not in this HD online version of the game. It's also interesting to note that the Soul Calibur 2 logo, its color changes depending on the version of the game that it's on, which console it's on. And it also associates with a different version of the main swords for the game. So for example, the PlayStation 2 box art is associated with the evil version of Soul Calibur and it's colored blue. The GameCube box art is associated with Soul Calibur itself, 
and it's colored green. And the Xbox box art is associated with Soul Edge and is colored red. Overall, the game was praised for its competitive balance until after repeated high-level play, criticisms arose through potentially game-breaking bugs that were found. Now, let's see how we can describe these, including the 2G bug, which allowed players to block immediately after being guard impacted, as well as G-step, which allowed players to sidestep vertical attacks and immediately cancel their sidestep, allowing for instant punishment. So this gave certain characters actual advantages over others, and until those were discovered, it was actually well-balanced. But unfortunately, there's not much available in terms of development history for Soul Calibur 2. The interviews I found often were like a lot of questions about like shooting down rumors. Like, oh, could we, was it possible that we could see a, a Soul Calibur game on Game Boy Advance? I mean, we've got Tekken on Game Boy Advance and he's like, the director's like, oh, oh yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd love to see it, but we'll see what fans say. Or rumors, is Soul Calibur 2 actually developed on Nintendo hardware for arcades? And it's like, no, no, it wasn't. Uh, that's, that's just a rumor. It's not right. Or like, why did you bring Soul Calibur 2 to all three consoles? Was it's just the original Soul Calibur? Was only, only Sega Dreamcast powerful enough to run it? And it's like, well, we want to expand our audience and... If all three consoles can run our game, we'd like to bring the game to all. Like, not great questions in these interviews, unfortunately. When you have the director there, or not even much in terms of the, the soundtrack, to be honest. But the game was reviewed very highly, with a Metacritic score of 92 on the PS2 and Xbox version, 93 on the GameCube version. The HD online version didn't fare as well, though, with a 77 on the Xbox 360 version. Greg Kasavin of GameSpot, who's now a writer and designer at Supergiant Games, praised the game, saying, quote, It's certainly one of the most refined, most accessible, and best-looking 3D fighting games to date, and it's squarely the best game in its class for the Xbox and GameCube. As of 2007, that GameCube version sold about a million copies in the U.S., and 100,000 copies in Japan, making it one of the best-selling third-party GameCube games. It won Fighting Game of the Year from the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences, and in the first-ever Spike Video Game Awards in 2003, Soul Calibur II won in the category Most Addictive Game. Hmm. Such a weird, nebulous category. Bad category, yeah. Not, uh, yeah. Man. I don't miss the Spike Video Game Awards. <laughs> and all of its celebrity hosts. Well, as we mentioned, Soul Calibur continues to this day. Uh, main installments in the franchise include 2005 Soul Calibur 3 on PlayStation 2. Uh, it added a creative character mode, but there weren't really any big guest characters. However, they brought the guest characters back for each of the subsequent installments. 2008's 4 on Xbox 360 and PS3, as you mentioned. Darth Vader on the PS3 version. Yoda on the 360 version. And to fill out the Star Wars roundup lineup, Starkiller, the apprentice from Star Wars Force Unleashed, is also a guest character. Then there was 2012 Soul Calibur V, also on Xbox 360 and PS3, where Ezio Auditore da Firenze made an appearance from Assassin's Creed, his two Brotherhood and Revelations trilogy. Then 2018 Soul Calibur VI, on PS4 and Xbox One featured Geralt of Rivia from the Witcher series, making apparently a pretty big role appearance in the game's story. And then in the season pass for Soul Calibur VI, guest characters included 2B from Nier Automata and Haomaru from Samurai Showdown. There were other spin-offs in the Soul Calibur series, including 2007 Soul Calibur Legends for Wii, which we mentioned previously in Tales of Symphonia, our episode for that, because Lloyd Irving showed up as a guest character in that. The soundtrack for Soul Calibur II is primarily composed by Junichi Nakatsuru, who was born in 1969 in Japan. He has a blood type of O. Gotta love it when that comes out about Japanese composers i don't know it's just such an interesting thing that they care a lot about i guess they do well growing up 
Junichi played around with instruments while listening to music on the radio as a boy. His parents provided him with classical piano lessons, but he would always play popular songs with his own arrangements instead of actually practicing for the lesson. While attending high school, Junichi Nakatsuru played the trombone in a brass band, and he was a keyboardist and band composer in his spare time. He ended up majoring in art at university and studied music theory, acoustics, and desktop music, though he was always more interested in making original songs and playing them in a band. As a composer, he thinks live orchestra is best for scenes that need an emotional presentation, but sometimes battle scenes may, quote, need the speed and tension that can only be done with a computer. He's been at Namco for a long time. He's still at Namco. And he says that the orchestral sound of John Williams' soundtrack to Star Wars Episode I, The Phantom Menace, deeply influenced him. I could definitely hear that. Yeah, Mm -hmm. that checks out. (laughs) Yep, especially for Soul Calibur 2. You can follow Jinichi Nakatsuru on Twitter at J1 underscore sound. His discography includes quite a lot of Namco games, including pretty much the entire Soul Calibur series. Ace Combat 5. Zero, six, and seven, Tekken five through seven, Ridge Racer six, and most recently, Damon X Machina on Nintendo Switch. Interesting. Hmm. He did quite a few arrangements in the Super Smash Brothers series, and we love highlighting when the composers make arrangements for that. In Super Smash Brothers for 3DS and Wii U, he arranged the menu music, Final Destination version two, which is the version that starts with that electric guitar riff and is really heavy on the electric guitars circuit from mario kart 7 we sports series medley lost in thoughts all alone from fire emblem fates theme of bayonetta mysterious destiny instrumental from bayonetta and tomorrow is mine bayonetta 2 theme instrumental in super smash brothers ultimate junichi nakatsuru also arranged the menu theme in that game yes the amazing one battlefield and 11th street from Fatal Fury Wild Ambition with the Terry DLC. I guess maybe Yoko Shimomura might outnumber him? I don't know. That might be the most any of our composers have done for Smash. I feel like it's at least the most consequential one with the menu theme. I mean, that's it's pretty amazing. Yeah, it, absolutely. 100%. <laughs> as far as the historical development research for Soul Calibur II's soundtrack, the composition team includes Junichi Nakatsuru, Yoshihito Yano, Asuka Sakai, Ryo Hamamoto, Ryuichi Takada, and Junichi Takagi. There was a 35-track soundtrack released, and also 28 of the tracks were included in a CD that was distributed with the game Strategy Guide in North America, titled Soul Calibur II Limited Edition Strategy Guide Soundtrack. The GameCube version of the game, since it had Link from The Legend of Zelda as a guest character, It received an exclusive track that was a remix of the Legend of Zelda theme, which played in Link's profile as well as his destined battle. Also interesting to note that Namco, like they also did with Star Fox Assault a couple years later, really delivered on a great orchestral soundtrack, especially for GameCube, but really for this generation of consoles. And we talked about how rare it seemed like an orchestrated soundtrack seemed on Nintendo GameCube because of the compression of its 1.5 gigabytes or whatever on that mini disc. I mean, obviously, classics like Shadow of the Colossus on PlayStation 2 could have such a, a fantastic soundtrack, but GameCube, they were hard to come by. It seemed like a priority for Namco. So what does this soundtrack sound like for Soul Calibur 2? Let's get to the five critical tracks. We have to start with Under the Star of Destiny. This is the opening theme of the game, plays in the opening cinematic, and it really goes places because you're showing a whole lot of different scenes on a lot of different characters. 
I mean, even there's flamenco guitar in this piece, but we're not playing that in the clip. I think it's one of the great opening themes, opening cinematic themes of the time. Uh, it just really has a lot of great energy. And even at the end of this clip, uh, you know, it building to the ultimate title splash. Man, it's such a good theme. And I know it's going to bring back a lot of memories for people who played back in the day and may not have heard the music since then. I really dig the drum part of the song, like a lot. Mm. Uh, you can hear in the clip just that really heavy drum. Uh, just going to town. Just, man, really giving this, this piece like a sense of, a sense of movement, I guess. That, that to me really makes it feel super epic. Like it's, it's here. It's time for a very historic, important battle. Uh, even though it plays in the opening theme and not right. during a fight. <laughs> right. And it just goes to show like the power of live performance versus a MIDI. Like you can feel the power behind those instruments and that drum part specifically. Let's move on to number two on the critical five. This is history unfolds. This would be your character select screen. And I'm going to throw it out there. I think it might be one of the best character select themes of all time. I'll throw it in possibly as my top 10. Maybe 20? <laughs> like, <laughs> you back down from that really fast. I mean, in case people have doubt, I mean, I'm, you're trying to think of all the fighting game mm -hmm. character select screens of all time. I think like this one brings back so many memories for me. And I think even though it's a 20 second loop, the quality is so good. And it's, you know, I'm going to take you for a ride is, is comical and nostalgic in a certain way. But like for 2002, uh, this was everything. This was it. I, maybe Smash Brothers Melee would be like the only thing that beats it around this time. Yeah. I think Melee would give it a real good run for its money. I think you're right on that. Uh, for me, it, it it actually kind of fits being a character select screen because what I hear is this is a song that would play when like an army is preparing to enter battle. And so if you really think about it, a character select screen in a fighting game is preparing to enter battle because you're picking who you're going to be playing as. This made more sense in my head, but. I think it definitely works as like the build up song of it's about to go down. Let's do it. It's also making me think just how good this would work in a Fire Emblem game. That's all right. So listening to it, I was like, what does this remind me of? That's it. That right there. It's Fire Emblem. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Perfect. Ah, so good. Number three on the Critical Five for Soul Calibur 2. This is Confrontation. This plays in the Lakeside Coliseum stage. So there's the stage theme there, and that's the stage that Netgrid is usually associated with. I feel like it's one of the themes that has kind of like carried over into future Soul Calibur games. At least that's what the YouTube comments seem to indicate. Like they like know that like hearing this like just makes me think of Soul Calibur in general. Like one of those themes that is just like extended and has lasted the test of time. And it's so good. Like you start with this triumphant melody in the lower horns and then it eventually passes on to the trumpets, but another just great pace and just drive here. And then later in the piece, like knows how to dip down into these quiet points. 
Uh, just a really memorable track from this game. One of the better stage themes. I think the best one is coming up next, but uh, it's just a, a really, really emblematic Soul Calibur theme. And this also sounds a lot like something I would hear in Fire Emblem. Earlier Fire Emblem, probably not Three Houses, but like, I kind of feel like I could hear this song playing in like Awakening. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. But like, it's, uh, I, I agree with the uh, whole idea that I think, yeah, the trumpets make this song real, real good and have this nice triumphant sort of feeling to it. And I know nothing about Necrid. I don't even know what Necrid looks like. I can probably guess, considering you've said designed by Todd McFarlane, so big muscles and a lot of buckles, but... <laughs> a green ogre-like brute. Not like Shrek, but <laughs> yeah, think of Todd McFarlane Edge. Yeah, that sounds like Todd McFarlane. Um, but <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's this is a very good song. Number four on the five critical tracks, this is Raise Thy Sword. Had to put this one in the game. This is my favorite from the soundtrack. It's actually composed by Yoshihito Yano, whereas the others so far had been from Junichi Nakatsuru. This is the stage theme to the Othsreinsberg Chapel. And a quote from the Soul Calibur fandom wikia, quote, it is Nightmare, Heihachi, Spawn, and Link's home stage. It is used as the location for all destined battles. This is the place where Nightmare fought against Raphael for the rights of Soul Edge. So yes, a consequential stage in the game, uh, in its canon overall, but uh, this kind of breaks a little bit from that Fire Emblem sounding, I think, because like there are big stakes here. And I most associate the game with this song. I think it's a way almost we break away from Fire Emblem and get a little bit more towards Castlevania. It's almost a little gothic sounding like with the organ, especially in, in the back half of this clip. Just a great song. Uh, I feel like I, I may be on an island out there, but hopefully other Soul Calibur 2 fans out there definitely remember the, the power of this song. I like the song. I, I don't think it's my favorite. I think my favorite is actually the next track, uh, personally. But... I do find it kind of funny, though. Like, I get why. I 100% get why. But it's it's Nightmare, and then the three guest characters. That's It's their home stage. <laughs> <laughs> and there are like seven stages in the game. There aren't that many. But, yeah, I would agree that the, the gothic feel. I, I think Castlevania is right on the money there. Uh, though, Castlevania tends to lean a little bit heavier into, like, adding guitar and a little bit of rock yeah, in there. Yeah. Especially more modern Castlevania stuff. But I could easily see this in, like, maybe Symphony of the Night, sort of, some of it. Yeah. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Let's wrap up the Critical Five, then, with Brave Sword, Braver Soul. Also composed by Yoshihito Yano, this takes place at the Kaminoi Castle Sakura Dai Gate stage, and this is primarily known as Taki's stage. So yeah, you're definitely getting like the Japanese instruments here, the kind of the sound there, and they are great sounding instruments. I mean, wow. Let's stress again, hearing this on GameCube was fantastic. I always hear at the beginning of the clip, I always think it's like the sound of a ball dropping. Like, dun, 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 like it just, you know, bounces more and more as there isn't as much elevation on its bounce. That's always what I think of. 
But yeah, wow, what a great sound. What a great piece. And uh, it was tough to fill out the final spot here, but I think this is the most deserving one. Yeah, like I said, having heard all of these songs for essentially the first time ever, uh, this, I think, is my favorite. It's it's so cool sounding. Uh, it it kind of gives me... I know we keep comparing the soundtrack to other games, <laughs> most, mostly games that came after <laughs> after this one. For the most part, outside of like Symphony of the Night, Okami, Okami is where I'm is where I'm thinking here. Yeah, yeah, for, for obvious reasons, but like, but if it fits, very much so, and it's just it's really really cool. This is a really good song. I dig it a lot. So it was hard to have tracks, whether it's you know making the cut or ending up here on the cutting room floor. So I have a couple. This one is called Eternal Struggle. This piece takes place on the Pirates Alcove stage which is the home to Cervantes and Maxi. Don't know why it's Maxi's home stage, but definitely Cervantes the pirate, yeah. Does it sound a bit like Pirates of the Caribbean? Please remember that this game came out before Pirates of the Caribbean Curse of the Black Pearl. I'm not gonna say there was any inspiration there, but uh, wow, does it fit as a piratey theme? And I have always loved this piece because of that. I can take it one step further, actually. It reminds me, it does remind me of Pirates of the Caribbean, but in a very specific way, being it reminds me of the battle music from Kingdom Hearts 3 in the Caribbean. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. That's really interesting. Wow. (laughs) I mean, a really, really good piece. And then the other one is Sword of the Patriot. This one composed by Ryo Hamamoto. It is the stage theme for Huangshou Palace, Phoenix Court, which is seen as Sungmina and Jungsun's stage. Wow, uh, what a big swell here for this one. And another piece where, like, when it dips down and, like, some of these quiet parts really handled well before then building back up with steep crescendos and back to the energy. Really love... The feel of this one, the sound of this, uh, good to have it on the cutting room floor, but it really battled it out with uh, Brave Sword, Braver Soul. Yeah, this is a, I think this is a real good song, but again, I think I like Brave Sword, Braver Soul a bit more. I think you made the right call on that. What will I never forget about Soul Calibur 2? Besides being really bad at the game, <laughs> but it, just a really good fighting game for the time. Has it been wildly outclassed since then? Yes. I mean, going back to look at it, it's like, oh yeah, it's a little little rough in points. But for the time, for 2002, remarkable. Uh, just so good. And that soundtrack for this generation of consoles, just amazing. Just amazing. One day I will play more than 10 minutes of a Soul Calibur game. Six is pretty tempting. I like 2B. She's pretty cool. One day. <laughs> let's transition to our next game though and we'll talk about a fan cover fan remix so that's from oc remix youtube what have you this one comes from metal legend 64 on youtube and it's got to be raise thy sword I, I love the theme so much i had to hear what a metal cover of it sounded like and, and metal legend 64 delivered here hope you enjoy we'll be right back
let us have an entire like change in tone well i guess not tone but like aesthetic like these two games could not be less aesthetically compatible if we tried and i kind of love that because it's gonna be a whiplash change (laughs) oh yeah oh yeah so lethal league blaze is my game Let's talk about it. It was originally released for the PC on October 24th, 2018, with a console release following for PS4, Xbox One, and Nintendo Switch on July 12th, 2019. It was developed and published by Team Reptile, which is a studio based out of the Netherlands. Uh, Lethal League Blaze is a fighting game? Sort of? Technically? Kind of? So, imagine a fighting game, but also it's tennis without a net. That's Lethal League Blaze. (laughs) Uh, I would like to give a quick shout-out if you find yourself at all interested in this this game. I am gonna have a hell of a time trying to explain how it plays, uh, and I'm gonna be uh, going over quite a bit and, like, skimming over quite a bit, because there's a lot. I would like to give a shout out to Yakko CMN on YouTube. That's Y A K K O C M N, who has a fantastic video covering essentially everything you know about how the game plays. Uh, it's, I believe, literally called "Everything You Need to Know About Lethal League Blaze," <laughs> and it's a it's a very entertaining video, and he explains everything way better than I'm going to be able to explain it. But here we go. So, in a typical fighting game, what you would do is you would try to hit your opponent with your fist, or your foot, or your butt, or your head, or whatever you're using to bludgeon your opponent. But in Lethal League, you are not actually trying to hit your opponent yourself. You are hitting a ball and trying to get that ball to hit your opponent. Basically, uh, every time you hit the ball, it will gain speed, and it ricochets off the edges of the stage, and if you get hit by the ball while it is another player's color, which it changes to your color if you hit it, uh, then you lose the round, essentially. And players can actually interact with the ball in multiple ways. They can hit it normally, which they have sort of a little bit of control over the ball's trajectory, like you can do directional inputs. When you hit the ball to sort of decide, well, it goes a little bit up or it goes a little bit down or straight and stuff like that. You can also do a smash, which is done by hitting left or right while hitting the ball in the air, which is a move that ups the ball's speed considerably, but always sends it in the same direction, which is diagonally down. So a lot of casual players like me do a lot of smashes. And eventually the opponent picks up on that and is just like, then I'm just going to stand here and just hit it (laughs) because I know exactly where the ball is going. Uh, You can do a spike, which is done by hitting the ball while it's directly under you, which you can send it either straight down or you can send it diagonally to the left or right. uh, And it also heavily increases the speed. You can do a bunt, which temporarily slows the ball. Like just you lightly hit it and it sort of, flaccidly falls into the air and then falls back towards you and i believe you can also directionally input which way the punt goes oh boy uh and that's sort of meant to play mind games as well as my favorite thing in lethal league which is you can just catch it and throw it (laughs) uh which makes for really really good mind games because it can knock people off their rhythm very easily Uh, every character has different modifiers that change how the different hits function uh for the most part just like what angles the ball goes flying at so like one example that yako cmn uses that i find really funny is that the character candy man when he performs a spike instead of sending the ball down it goes up and that doesn't make any sense but it actually does for candy man i guess i don't know but for the most part every single character has that same basic tool set. Those five moves are essentially what they have, but they also, each character has their own movement abilities. So for instance, Latch, the uh, the crocodile character, can climb walls because that's what crocodiles could do, I guess. Uh, the character Switch, a, a skateboarding robot, 
can skateboard up walls and on the ceiling. Because, of course, he can. Uh, the character Jet can use a jetpack on her back to hover, and it's, it's all sorts of stuff like that. So one of the most interesting things about Lethal League, though, is that as the ball moves faster, it will take longer to go flying once it is hit. So, like, when the ball is going slow, you'll hit the ball and it'll it'll immediately go. But when it's going super fast, there's, like, this really dramatic, almost slowdown, where you hit it and it makes this really loud sound and the screen starts shaking and then after a second or two then it goes uh and you can tell when it's going to go by this little meter that's on the bottom of the screen uh it's it's very neat but the main thought of that is well then why can't the opponent just come and hit the ball immediately the instant they know it's going to let out so in lethal league you could do a thing called a parry ring which it makes a blue ring around your ball, and if the opponent tries to hit it, then they'll be stunned, which is obviously not great when you're trying to dodge a super fast ball. But the downside to it is that if you are trying to parry, the opponent can actually just walk up, grab the ball with the catch button, and throw it in your face. So you can combat this by the parry being cancelable. So you can start a you can start a parry to bait your opponent into jumping up and trying to grab the ball and then cancel the parry right as they're doing it and then the ball goes right in their stupid face and they die. Basically what I'm trying to say (laughs) is that Lethal League looks super simple on the outside but there is a lot to this game. Like, it's, it's got a lot of depth to it. Not to mention, that's not even me getting into the fact that every character has a special that they can perform mm. uh, with meter in typical fighting game fashion. So like the character dice can hit a curveball, <laughs> And apparently if you really know what you're doing, you could do all sorts of crazy stuff with it. Uh, Candyman turns the ball into his head so that instead of like ricocheting off of the walls, it passes through them and wraps around to the other side of the screen. Uh, and that continues until somebody else hits it. Like, it's, it's nuts. It's, there's a lot to Lethal League, and it, I think, is the absolute definition of easy to learn, hard to master. Because, again, the main concept behind Lethal League, super simple, hit the ball. Hit the ball, try to hit the opponent with it. And then when you start really getting into the meat of it, that's when it starts to get very, very complicated uh, in a great way. Like, it's a very surprisingly deep game. Uh, There is a story mode in the game about an illegal underground league that plays this super dangerous game where the ball can go to like a thousand miles per hour, uh, which is nuts. It's kind of an afterthought, to be perfectly honest. Uh, I think the cast and the gameplay in general is enough to hold up the game in its own right without without the story mode sort of getting involved. Uh, And this is where I will ask, what are our experiences with Lethal League Blaze? I've seen some rounds of the original Lethal League played out, and it's the same sort of concept, right? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Super fun to watch. I've never actually played it. I feel it was actually like, I saw it right before Blaze was coming out on PC. And it was like, oh, let's look up what this game is. Oh, but it's got a sequel coming out. Super fun to watch. You're absolutely right that it's like, yeah, the concept's easy, but it gets wild fast. Yeah, high-level Lethal League play is so cool and really, really, really tense. Uh, I absolutely adore it, and I wish this game had a bigger competitive community behind it so that I could see it more at, like, big tournaments. Yeah, why isn't it at Evo? Who knows? Uh, It was once. We'll get to that in a little while. Hmm. But I actually reviewed this game for Nintendo World Report. I joked when I joined the site that this and Valhalla were the two games that I just needed to snipe the reviews for and that I would retire. And I did both of those reviews. So I win, essentially, is what I'm saying. And uh, it's really, really good. My roommate bought it immediately after playing it with me for a little while. And we're both very adamant of, like, more of our friends need to buy this game so they can play it with us. 
because it's it's so much fun. Even if you're not very good at it, even if you don't know all the ins and outs and you don't know how parrying works and you're not entirely sure how every character's movement abilities work, even with like the basic bare bones knowledge, it's a blast. This game's super fun. And I think it's just a really unique take on a fighting game that I really, really appreciate. So, Lethal League has 12 playable characters in it, Lethal League Blaze. Seven of them are from the original game, one of them being the boss character. That is Raptor, who is a baseball player. Uh, That's his whole character. He's a baseball player. (laughs) Uh, Switch, who is the skateboarding robot I mentioned earlier. Candyman, who... You've probably seen him. If you've seen any character in this game, you've seen Candyman. He's the the smiley face, googly eye guy in a suit. He is on the art for this game, whether it's the YouTube thumbnail or the podcast art. Yes. Uh, Sonata, who is a really cool lady with a, like, stereo hammer. It's really neat. Latch, who is a cybernetic crocodile, because that's just a thing. Uh, Dice, who is a ping pong player. That's That seems to be all of his character as well. Uh, or Doombox, who was the boss character in the original Lethal League. Uh, new characters in this game include Jet, who is essentially, if you told me she was a guest character from Jet Set Radio, I would believe you. She's wearing rollerblades. She looks like she's from Jet Set Radio. She's very cute. It's it's She's great. She's the character that I play. Uh, you have Grid who kind of looks like Shocker, like classic Spider-Man villain Shocker, but he's got like plugs on his hands and he's a big gorilla man. It's weird. Uh, And Nitro, who is a cop who was tired of police corruption and left the force to, quote, pursue his own justice. His special is, as Yako CMN puts it, he arrests the ball. (laughs) He has like a giant set of handcuffs as his main weapon and he like flings it out and traps the ball in one of the handcuffs and then swings it towards the opponent it's bizarre Uh, and it also got two dlc characters after its release being toxic who is a cool looking lady with a big poison arm it's it's really neat and the most recent character being dust and ashes which is a dude who i guess was given a JoJo-style stand after a failed attempt at executing him, is how I understand it. He's pretty cool, though. And uh, so that's the entire roster of, of the game. There's not a, It's not a huge roster, but each character has their own differences that make them a lot of fun. And you'll notice that I said that seven of them were from the original, because Blaze is actually a sequel to a 2014 Flash game that was simply titled Lethal League, which did actually get a release on most major platforms, being PC, PS4, and Xbox One. Uh, Apparently no Wii U. Not super surprising on that front. Not gonna lie. So according to the developers, the idea came from a mechanic in Team Reptile's first game called Megabyte Punch, which is actually also available on Switch. I didn't realize that, but it came out like two months ago. So that's interesting. It's like a platformer, it seems. Uh, But there's a mechanic in it where you can hit and reflect projectiles. And I guess this evolved into the idea of what if we had a game that was about two players hitting and reflecting a projectile and trying to hit each other with it? That works. Uh, Super Smash Brothers was apparently a major inspiration for the game, which does definitely fit in with the whole easy to learn, hard to master mentality, because that's kind of what Smash goes for as well. Smash is a very simple game. It's very beginner friendly in terms of a fighting game. But if you really want to get good at Smash, you have to learn some complex stuff. But in terms of aesthetic, it also takes visual cues from games like Jet Set Radio. In fact, like I said, Jet literally might as well be named legally distinct Jet Set Radio character. And also... One other thing related to Jet Set Radio that we'll get to in a little bit. Uh, The original version, though, featured 2D art for the characters. It was like sprites and uh, 2D stages and all that. So the Flash version, they say, was developed in around two weeks. 
And once it was released, it actually caught the attention of Adam Hart, who would later go on to be the main designer behind Dive Kick. And he was at the time writing for SureYouCan.com, which is the website that was behind Evo. And through him, Lethal League ended up featured as the grand final mystery game at the Ultimate Fighting Game Tournament 9. So I guess it was like every round was a different fighting game. And then the final round was a mystery game that nobody knew, and mm. that ended up being Lethal League. Which, I love tournaments like that. Those are so neat. So, with all this new attention that came from that tournament, Team Reptile decided, hey, you know, maybe we should put this game into a, like, this prototype that we made into a full game. And so, Lethal League ended up being put together for a full release that was then showcased at EVO in 2014, right before its full release on Steam. And through that, it would wind up being featured by a bunch of YouTubers. The most notable ones that I noticed were The Game Grumps, Markiplier, all sorts of big names like that were playing Lethal League. And so it got a ton of attention from stuff like that. And so they decided, hey, let's make a sequel. Lethal League Blaze moved to 3D models for the characters and made various changes to mechanics and, of course, added the new characters. They also... uh specify that they went with the name Blaze instead of calling it Lethal League 2 because they did not want to imply that you had to play the original game first, which, I mean, fighting games, that's, I feel like that's kind of understood. Yeah. But at the same time, like, eh, you're not exactly a big name, so... I, I guess, but yeah, especially when numbers usually do better in sales. That's, that's interesting. Mm-hmm. Their overall goals were apparently to not have the game be punishing for new players while still retaining the hype gameplay, while also making the game more complex than it initially seems for hardcore players to really sink their teeth into, which judging by the fact that I struggled to explain how the game plays earlier in the show, nailed it. Lethal League Blaze was reviewed very well when it was reviewed at all, but it seems like it went rather ignored by publications upon both releases, both PC and console. Uh, The only version that has enough reviews to give it a Metacritic score is the Switch version, where it has an 82. Uh, Everything else has like one or two reviews, and they all are around 80, 90. But uh, on Metacritic, for people who aren't aware, the game only gets like an average score once it has four reviews. It just, on all the other platforms, it just never hit that number. So that's a little bit disconcerting. Everybody should play this game. Uh, Team Reptile is currently working on their next game being Bomb Rush Cyberfunk. Uh, It is essentially them saying, well, if Sega won't give us a new Jet Set Radio, then we will make it ourselves. So I'm very excited for that. That should be super cool. And if it is anywhere near the quality that Lethal League is, they have earned my money already, and the game didn't even have a release date yet. And we've mentioned that game on the show, right, in our headlines, because it Mm -hmm. was, uh, the sound card was Naganuma, uh, you know, sort of settings. and Naganuma compatible was there. There you go, yeah, yeah. It got the original composer behind Jet Set Radio, and to be perfectly honest, that was the most important part. Yes. So... Definitely looking forward to that game. Uh, don't think it has a release date yet, but uh, it's it's going to be really cool. So it was hard to decide who I was going to cover for this for a reason I'll get into in a bit, but I, I ended up settling on Klaus Veen, or his real name is Kelvin von Wienendahl. When asked where the name Klaus Veen came from, he says, quote, I played a lot of Counter-Strike and used Klaus as a nickname. Klaus was the name of a musician called Klaus Wunderlich, and every time I killed someone, I played an obvious tune of him, just for the troll of it. Veen comes from my last name, Wienendahl, which makes sense. He says in an interview that I was actually able to find, funnily enough, an interview composed by Team Reptile themselves, not even for a publication, like Team Reptile, uh, he says he first began putting together his own music when he was 10 or 11 years old, when he was given a PC with the software Rebirth, which is not just a Kingdom Hearts title, I guess. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, he says he comes from a very musical family, and he immediately had fallen in love with making music when his uncle had gotten himself a drum machine, and he sort of got really into making his own drum loops and stuff like that. When asked what artists inspire him, he says house artists like Carrie Chandler, Todd Terry, and Todd Edwards. Uh, His favorite Lethal League character, for what it's worth, is Raptor, the baseball guy. You can find him on Bandcamp at klausveen.bandcamp.com. As far as I can tell in terms of discography, this is his only real foray into games. He mainly does his own music, which he releases on Bandcamp, and you should definitely go check it out. Though, in that interview, he mentions that he does sound effects and sound design for an app company, but does not specify what company. So, when I say that it was a little bit hard for me to decide who I was going to cover. Uh, the soundtrack is actually an amalgam of a bunch of artists' work. Uh, Klaus Veen, I specifically picked to focus on because he appears to have a majority of the tracks, though not by much. Uh, there is no singular release of the soundtrack. Instead, Team Reptile actually encouraged each artist to release their work that was in the game on their own band camps as singles so that they could make their own money off of it. And so you should go find and buy the music that I'm about to highlight here. And again, buy the game. I think for a soundtrack like this, where it's them specifically going out to different artists to get different songs, I think as much as it's kind of a pain for the consumer, this is the way to go about it, I think. It's the fairest to get the artists the most money, so kudos to them. Yeah, it's it's a really good way to go about it. But let's get into how this game sounds in total opposition to Soul Calibur 2. Boy, is it. We're going to start with our five critical tracks, the first one being Beverly Chills. <laughs> This song is by Aaron Evo. It is the default menu music of the game. You can actually change the menu music to be any song you want after you've unlocked it. But this is the default. So I think it's really, you know, it's notable for that. This is a really, really cool hip hop vibe with some really strong synths. Uh, And I do like that it, it seems like it's encouraging you to sort of snap your fingers to. Uh, I think it does a great job conveying the overall tone and aesthetic that Lethal League is really trying to bring across. It's it's going for its street, its jet set, its its hip hop, uh, and it's just, in my opinion, a main menu that you don't get super tired of very quickly. It's a great song. I'm sorry, I don't like this one at all. <laughs> it feels really slapdash to me, and it feels like we're, we're just trying different sound effects, like especially like the the record scratching. Almost, uh, I, I get how you could snap your fingers to it, but when I was listening to this the first time, I'm like, "Are you serious? This this is what this soundtrack's gonna be like." <laughs> I'm sorry. And then I also like when writing out Aaron Evo's name, like I just had the habit of like capitalizing Evo. Like, I, I yeah, know. I can see that. <laughs> I don't know. I, I dig it a lot, but I could definitely see how the, the like record scratch and all that might might turn some folks off. I could get that. But let's get to critical track number two. Ordinary Days V2. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh,
So this one is by Klaus Veen. Uh, it plays on the Retro Room 21 stage, which I am uh, never going to hear in-game because I believe you have to play like 5,000 matches for it to unlock. That's a lot, and I don't think I'm going to hit that anytime soon. Uh, so this is kind of Candyman's theme. It played in the original game. It's mostly notable because this is a remix of a song that was written for the first Lethal League. It played in Room 21, which is the padded room that Candyman comes from. It's an insane asylum. Candyman is crazy. Oh, not surprising. One of his alternate costumes is, instead of a suit, he's wearing a straight jacket. <laughs> it, it's really, it's a really good costume. Uh, and honestly, this is a little more weirdly low key than I would think for Candyman, but I think it's really, really good. And that, that one sort of, uh, voice sample is a little bit weird, but after you sort of get used to it, I think I, I dig this song. Oh yeah. No, this is more my speed. I like this one a lot. And then hearing this one, it's like, okay, we're, we're, we're back on track. Now I can see why you're, you're starting to, to pick this one. <laughs> uh, but yeah, yeah, definitely a great vibe here. I feel like though that a complaint that some people might have with this soundtrack, and this is just like oftentimes electronic music in general, it gets a bit repetitive. Mm -hmm. If you're vibing out and just zoning out, it's great. But if like you're intently listening, it's just like, okay, how, how much longer? Well, what do you, oh, you didn't add new instruments or samples in this after the four bars. Okay. Interesting. Like, I feel like that could be a complaint that some people have, but like, if you're, if you're chilling out to this one, it's a good one. That and, it's kind of hard to focus on the music being repetitive when the ball is moving 500 miles per hour. Right. Accurate. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but so that plays in the retro room 21, but in the modern room 21, the one specifically for blaze, the song that plays is critical track number three snippet. <laughs> quite understand why it's called that but whatever uh, this is also by klaus veen it has a very similar tone to ordinary days i think but uh maybe this is Candyman's theme i don't know a at the very beginning of the piece it's not in the it's not in the clip but because this takes place in a, a sane, insane asylum it kind of fits really well that there's just this ah! at the very <laughs> beginning like somebody screaming far in the distance which again aesthetically fits it's an insane asylum uh but i think this one kind of fits Candyman a little bit more it's still a little too low key in my opinion but that those sax samples kind of really fit his uh you know his dapper clothing if that mm. makes sense yeah this also sounds really good and you can definitely tell it's the same composer like it's same sort of vibe same bass sound um, I'm, I'm digging this one too. Good pick. The next one is actually my second favorite song in the game. There's a very clear favorite song in the game. It's very, yeah, very 100% clear. But this one, I think comes very close to, uh, to hitting that second place. And it is critical track number four, Ruiner. This song is by the artist Big Nick, B-I-G-N-I-C. It is the song for the Workbot Factory stage. And oh boy, this song goes hard. Like, talk about a complete change in tone from the last two songs. Yeah. Uh, it's got those heavy synths. It's got really heavy drums. It's got this industrial feeling that fits the whole factory setting really well. 
I've never heard this song in game because I haven't unlocked the work factory stage. The way that the game works for unlocking stages and stuff is you gotta earn currency by playing matches and doing story mode and all that, and then you can buy them and the thing. And it's they they all cost a lot of coins. It's it's one of my only complaints. But oh man, this song is good. Oh, it's just really in your face and it's it's sinister feeling and oh, it's so good. So good. Great sound. Uh, totally accurate for it to be a factory. I did not know that before, but yep, that absolutely fits. And it's uh, another one where it is repetitive if you listen to the whole thing, but again, uh, fits the vibe of the stage, I'm sure, very well. And then, like I said, there's a clear number one song on this soundtrack, and it, this is in no way to disrespect everybody else that did music for the soundtrack. It's all so good. But the clear standout is critical track number five. Ain't nothing like a funky beat. This song was by the man, the myth, the legend, Hideki Naganuma himself. It plays on the Subway's stage. Uh, If you've heard any song from Lethal League Blaze, it's this one. You have heard this one. Uh, It was done by the Jet Set Radio man himself. I mean, come on. I believe now when asked, he claims that this is his favorite composition that he's ever done. Uh, It used to be Concept of Love. From Jet Set Radio Future, now it is Ain't Nothing Like a Funky Beat from Lethal League Blaze. Uh, personal favorite on the soundtrack. I think it's the the number one with a bullet on the whole thing. It is such a good song. It is Naganuma at his best. All this song rules. Yeah, it's amazing. Definitely my favorite as well. I feel like I had heard the title Ain't Nothing Like a Funky Beat before, but I'd never heard the song. And finally getting to hear it. Yeah, wow, that delivers. Is that like a James Brown sample? I have no idea. I wish I knew where Naganuma got any of his samples. <laughs> I, it sounds like it could be. Could be. I mean, pitch shifted up, of course. But yeah, wow. Uh, this song owns. I'll be real. This song is the reason this game was brought to the show. <laughs> like this song alone. I- I'm sure there are games where it could be like, I just want to talk about one song. And like, it would be this song from this game for sure, without a doubt. It's it's so, so good. There's one part, it's not in the clip because it's not super indicative of the song as a whole, but there's a part near the end where everything sort of drops out and just this the dent 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 It's so, oh, the pace is perfect. The samples are great. It's just such a good song. Love Ain't Nothing Like a Funky Beat. Four tracks on the cutting room floor. I've got two, the first one being Decibel. This is by Frank Klopaki, and the main reason I bring this one to the table, I I think this song is all right. It's a pretty good song, but it's it's definitely not among my favorites. But Frank Klopaki is apparently a composer who is well known for his work on the Command and Conquer franchise. Hmm. Which this is a very weird place to find that. And apparently, this sounds like music from Command and Conquer. If the YouTube comments were anything to go by, mm, I could hear it. But it's spelled wrong. He does B L E. <laughs> hey, I, don't look at me. This plays in the Scrap Desert stage, apparently, which is another one that I have never unlocked. Uh, it's got a really good bass part. I'll give it that. Like I like the bass part a lot. Feels it feels good. It's not one of my favorites, but it's still pretty good. And after that, my second song on the cutting room floor is Whips. <laughs> Whips. (laughs) 
with a Z. Yeah, it's whips with a Z because we're cool kids now. Uh, it's not cool if you put a, an S. This is by the artist D Fast. It plays on the new Rise District stage. I'm going to be real. This is the most Jet Set Radio-like so- song on the soundtrack. Like, even more than Naganuma. <laughs> and the song he wrote. This song, you could tell me, was was from Jet Set Radio Future. And I'd believe you? It's a really good song, though. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely dig both of these. They're, they're good picks. And they didn't make the cut, but good to have them here. So what will I never forget? about Lethal League Blaze. Look, it's just a really fun, underrated multiplayer experience. If you like fighting games, but aren't really a fan of their overall complexity, but are looking for one that, realistically, a normal human could possibly learn, Lethal League is probably for you. And also, if you do like the complexity of fighting games, Lethal League is kind of also for you. I I think it's a win-win for just about everybody on any side of being interested in fighting games whatsoever, uh, it's, buy Lethal League. Play it, play it with me. I own it on Switch. Play it with me. I want to play Lethal League. Much easier to play Lethal League Blaze than Soul Calibur 2 these days, but uh, great and opposing soundtracks in their own right. But yeah, really good to cover these games. Thanks so much for listening. That'll do it for us this week on Original Sound Chat. You can follow me on Twitter at Pete Speakeasy. Joe is over at the Debaga. The video version of the show is on the Rhymes with Asia YouTube channel, also at rhymeswithasia.com. But it's that MP3 podcast that you really want. That's hosted by Anonymous Dinosaur at anondino.squarespace.com. It's also where Joe hosts his other podcast, Smasher Pieces, and you can find those on podcast storefronts all around the globe. Apple Podcasts, Google Play, uh, or YouTube Music, whatever they want to call it. Even on Spotify, we have the podcast on our big Spotify podcast feed with episodes and bonus tracks. But it's also that Spotify playlist that you want to find and listen to. Because if we talk about a song from a video game and it's on Spotify, it's going on that big Spotify playlist. Joe, anything being added this week? So Lethal League appears to all be on Spotify. But Soul Calibur is a little bit weird in that there is something titled Soul Calibur 2 Original Soundtrack, but it's only like five tracks. So I'm going to have to see what's up with that. So we'll, we'll, have to, we'll have to play that one by ear, I guess. That's weird. That's a first. Well, when you're done listening, you can follow us on social media at our, our handles. But also for the show's handle, it's at SoundChatOST. You can give us feedback on how we're doing. Give us suggestions for games that you want us to cover in the future. And then as far as bonus tracks are concerned, we're in production on Best of 2017. Gosh, I I can't believe how good that list is. That's amazing. It's a good lineup. Joe, who are we talking about next week? Next week, I begin my theme month, even though it's technically not that month yet, but I make the rules in my own head. I will be talking about Koji Nikura. I will be talking about Saori Yoshida. All right, Joe, let's play us out. So, I went to look for a remix of Funky Beat, because come on, that's what you grab. That's the song you look for. And also, I wasn't really sure I was going to be able to find anything else. Um, And I managed to find a mashup of Ain't Nothing Like a Funky Beat with the song What You Need from Sonic Rush, which is another game that Naganuma worked on. And it's super, super good. It's called What You Need is a Funky Beat. It is from YouTuber Spop, S P A H P. I assume that's uh, you pronounce it that way. I don't know, but it's really, really good. Like a hell of a mashup. So please enjoy that. Thank you so much for listening this week on Original Sound Chat. We'll see you next time. Take care. <laughs> <laughs>